Welcome, everybody, to the Legends of Hockey Show on the Grilling Truth Sports Network. I am your host for the Legends of Hockey Show, Mike Goodpaster, and today we have former New York Ranger, L.A. King, and he was on Survivor, Tom Laidlaw. How you doing, Tom? Or t- Good, Mike. How are you doing? All right. I've interviewed too many people today. I had a Todd a while ago. I almost called you Todd. But uh, that's cool. I'll, I'll take that. That's fine. Great to have you on the show. Actually, I grew up as a Rangers fan, and I lived in Indiana, and the way I discovered the Rangers was listening to a New York station when you could in Indiana back in the late 70s, and I heard the Stanley Cup finals against the Canadians. You grew uh, up in Canada. Tell us yeah. how big a part of your life, or how big a part was hockey in your life growing up? Sure. Well, growing up in Canada, it was, uh, especially at that time, it was a huge part of everybody's life. Uh, hockey is, you know, baseball is big here, football is big here in the United States, and, and hockey, it's just, it's, uh, I think it's such a source of pride for Canadian people because it's not as big a country. It's kind of like they're the, you know, the, uh, I guess the little brother to the United States. So uh, they take a lot of pride in their hockey. So growing up for me, it, 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 in so many ways, it really shaped me even for after hockey was done and, and my other careers, you know, the work ethic and uh, the determination and uh, just the knowledge that, you know, you may start off not being able to do something, but if you work hard at it, you'll be able to figure it out afterwards. When I first started playing hockey when I was a kid, like six years old, I was terrible. I, uh, I literally, I could not stand up on skates, but uh, I was very fortunate. I had parents that just dropped me off the rink and said, listen, if you want to do it, go do it. If you don't, that's up to you. And, uh, and I wanted to do it. So it worked out well. All right. So, when did you know this is the thing you wanted to do? When was it your goal to be to be in the NHL someday? Yeah. I, I, in fact, I can tell you exactly. I wrote a paper. My parents kept it. Even uh, going into first grade at the end of the summer, you come back to class and the teacher asks you to write the paper about what you did during the summer and uh, what your goals are for life. And uh, I wrote down in that paper that I was going to play in the National Hockey League at six years old. So, uh, so it was early on. It, again, it was it was such a you know, all kids in Canada, you know, most of the kids in Canada growing up want to play in the NHL. It's just, you know, you know, you're almost afraid. You're almost embarrassed to say, okay, that's what I want to do because well, of course you do, but nobody, you know, the chances of everybody making it are so slim. But uh, for me, it was just something that um, I wanted to do. And, and like I said, it was funny because I, we played box lacrosse there too. So during the summer, they take the ice out of the hockey rink and we play lacrosse inside the hockey rink on the cement floor. And I was a far better lacrosse player than I was a hockey player, but I just had in my head that I was going to be an NHL hockey player. And, and I just, I, I was so lucky. I think my upbringing too, I grew up on a dairy farm in Canada. So uh, my father and grandfather had to run the farm. So they're up every day, milking the cows, no matter what, didn't matter how they felt or what the weather was. And you no, know, nobody's writing any articles, you know, saying how great they were on newspapers or anything. So I kind of grew up with that mentality that, um, you know, you don't have to be the best. You don't have to be somebody that gets us all the headlines. You just keep grinding it every day. And, and that's really how I had any success I had both in my hockey career and in my careers after hockey. All right. So let's take us through how you ended up playing your college hockey at Northern Michigan. What was the recruiting process for that? <laughs> pretty, pretty simple recruiting process back then. Uh, uh, I was drafted uh, in the OHL draft. The Ontario Hockey League has a draft just like the NHL yeah. does. I was drafted by the Peterborough Peets and the legendary coach Roger Nielsen was coaching them. So I I went there for one training camp really wasn't ready to play yet so i went back home and played for my junior b team back home uh the bramley blues and uh i had a couple of teams you know brown was interested in me they had me send my grades into brown and unfortunately the brown coach was really polite he called me back one day he says tom we'd love to have you as a player but uh there's really just not much we can do with your grades the way they are so um so northern michigan uh in the first year i went there in 1976 was the first year they had a hockey program so the coach came and recruited myself and four other players off my junior team. So I was all excited. I was going to get to go to a, a U.S. college. Uh, my parents were happy. I was going to go there to supposedly get an education, and it was all paid for. And uh, and it turned out to be so great in so many ways. I, I Usually when kids go to your college, obviously there's upperclassmen there. So they've got to, you know, they get limited ice time in most situations. Uh, but I went there, and I was fortunate. We didn't have any upperclassmen. We were it. And I was lucky I got to be a four-year captain there. And uh, – Lots of ice time is really what I needed at that time to develop as a player. All right. Then we get to the NHL draft. You ended up going to the New Haven Nighthawks in the AHL. You were drafted by the New York Rangers. Um, yep. What was it like when you said it was your goal from the age of six? What was it like to yep. finally get that call? Uh, well, when I was drafted, it was interesting because now, especially 
I had a long career as an agent. So I was many years, I would take my players to the draft and it's a big thing. You go there and families come in and they're just, they're all dressed up in suits and ties and everything. Uh, but back then, except for maybe the top players getting drafted, we didn't even go to the draft. And to be honest with you, I don't even think I knew there was a draft. I knew there was a draft, but I didn't know when it was happening. And I was working a buddy of mine. Uh, he had a horse breeding farm in the Guelph, Ontario. So I was helping him out. Uh, it was a Saturday afternoon. We were in the uh, we were out the barn cleaning the you know what out of the stalls from the horses, and uh, obviously no cell phones back then. Uh, the Rangers had called my father at our farmhouse. He then called uh, the farm where I was living, so they brought me up to the house. I got on the phone, and my father said, I just got a call from the Rangers. You've been drafted in the sixth round by the Rangers. And I said, well, what do I do now? And he said, well, get back out there and finish cleaning the you know what out of the stalls. So that was my draft day, uh, cleaning out stalls and uh, horse stalls. And, and it was it was so different back then, too, because there was no contact with the Rangers. In fact, I think I maybe called them a few months later to see what I should do. And they just they kind of like discussed it with me. Well, get back up there in college and finish, you finish your college career. Uh, so it was, but that was, you know, when you're drafted, it's, uh, you know, you obviously, you know, that doesn't mean you've made the team, especially I was a six round draft pick. So there was no guarantee I was going to make it, but it was just another step along the way of getting towards and shoot, you know, the goals and dreams that I had. So it, it kind of gets a fire under you too. You realize, okay, I, I'm, I'm getting there, you know, I'm, so now I need to continue to work to, to now finally get there. So what's the story on the New Haven Nighthawks? You played one game there and then you're yeah. in the NHL. Yeah. So I, I was a great thing. I actually ended up playing more. That was one regular season game. And I played, I think like maybe 10, actually, or excuse me, uh, playoff games as well. So at the end of my college year, uh, I signed my contract with, uh, with the, when the actually when our college season was done, we'd gone to the national championships. Uh, I signed my contract with the Rangers. They brought me to New Haven to play in the playoffs, which was a great thing for me because it was, especially back then, you really don't have any access to the National Hockey League unless you know somebody or a relative or something that's in the NHL. Not like today where uh, I think the players are much more aware of what the NHL is all about. Uh, for us, Pro hockey, I just I had no clue. I didn't know anybody that had played in the NHL, nobody to talk to. So it was great for me to go to New Haven and play in the playoffs and see, you know, what the pro life was like, meet some of the players. Uh, when I first came to New York to sign my contract before they sent me to New Haven, it was the day of a game at Madison Square Garden for the Rangers, and Phyllis Mazzita was still playing. So I was in the locker room before the game, and uh, you know, Phil's this legendary hero. Uh, you know, I watched him play on TV all the time. He's got a huge personality, great player. Hall of Fame player and so he comes walking in the locker room before the game and I'm standing there and I'm just like oh my god you know as much as I'm you know, I've signed my pro contract I'm on my way but here's Phyllis Zito he's potentially going to be my teammate and he uh so obviously he didn't know who I was he pulled some of the trainers aside and I could see they were kind of whispering they were telling him who I was and he comes walking over to me and I swear I, it's one of those scenes that you just you couldn't I couldn't believe this was actually happening that Phyllis Zito was coming over to talk to me and he reaches out his hand. He was fantastic. He says, Tom, great to meet you. I've heard a bunch of great things about you. And obviously, he didn't really know that much other than what the trainers had just told him. But still, they, the effort, he didn't have to do that. It was the day of a game. And he came over and, uh, you know, said, welcome aboard. Really looking forward to playing with you. And I was like, oh, man, I could have died and gone to heaven right then. So it was uh, quite an experience. Yeah. And then we get to 1981. What was training camp like when you go in there? And what was the adjustment coming out of college? I know you said it helped a little bit, but it had to be a little bit of a culture shock once you're playing with NHL players. Yeah, and that was the biggest thing. The game itself, uh, I mean, this obviously it was much more, you know, more talented players, you know, real men, you know, bigger, more physical, tougher game. Uh, but it, it was really more just the culture shock. You're know, living in New York. You know, the travel, um, you know, the age difference now, instead of playing with guys all my age, you got guys that are married and families and everything. So that, that was all different, but the training camp was, um, so again, now it's the game's very different. So everybody comes into camp in shape. In fact, the veteran players are probably the best conditioned athletes and the younger kids need to learn a little bit more about conditioning back then. It was the exact opposite. The the players, the older players back then went by the theory that once the season was done, they would hang up the skates and really rest their bodies and then come back and have a longer training camp where they would get themselves in shape, have two day practices, play more games. Um, so the older guys weren't in that good of shape. The younger guys like myself, if you wanted to make the team, you better be in shape when you first come to camp, right? You can't act like you're a veteran. You got to act like you really want it. So I was in great shape, uh, 
and you know had a good good training camp. And again, I talk about Phil Esposito. Probably uh, you know two or three days into training camp, we're having a scrimmage at our practice facility. You know, it's a full on scrimmage, but it's still with the understanding that listen, we're just especially the old guys are just getting themselves going. And, and Phil had the puck; he was carrying it through the uh, neutral zone, and I'm on the other team. And he had his head down, and I'm a I was drafted and brought in to be a big, tough, physical defenseman to hit people and fight and all that stuff. And so Phil was uh, carrying the puck, and I said, "Well, I've got to do my job." And I just stepped into him, <laughs> just dropped him on a rear end. And man, he got up and he was hot. Like, and the building just went quiet. And I'm thinking to myself, what did I just do? You know, I, I feel Phil's going to want to send me home. He's just a player. He's going to want to get rid of me. But um, so we finished up practice, went to the locker room after. And uh, I'm sitting there, like, you're just wondering, like, hey, what did I do? You know, what's going to happen here? Phil starts walking towards me. And, you know, like, not more than 15 minutes ago, he was ready to take my head off. And he comes walking towards me. And I'm thinking, oh, God, here we go. And uh, he says, um, he says, I was mad at you out there. He says, but you really want to make this team, don't you? I says, yes, Phil. It's, it's all I ever wanted to do. And he said, you know what? I really respect you for that. You know, that you did what you had to do, but I'm mad at you. But I really respect you for what you did. So it was kind of like, that was the first step. Like, okay, wow. I've, you know, I've kind of passed a little bit of a hurdle there. Uh, you know, I, I'm doing what I have to do here. Guys are going to be mad at me, but that's the way it goes. So Phil was fantastic to me. He was, uh, that was his, his last year. He retired halfway through the year. And uh, so for him to be on the team and treat me the way he did, it wasn't just the way he treated me. He treated all the guys, the other young guys who were coming in as well, but he was just fantastic. And, uh, you know, training camp was, you know, it was every day was, you know, it's a test, you know, you're nervous every day. It's like, okay, I've got to play this just like I did with Phil. I have to play this like I'm trying to make the national hockey league and hit and do whatever I have to do. So, yeah, and you guys end up with a coaching change between the eighty and or between the eighty one and eighty two season. Of course, I'm an American, so you know I'm bringing this up. You yeah. get a chance to play for Herb Brooks. Craig Patrick yeah. was the general manager. I know he was the coach at the end of the eighty one season. You guys made a run in the playoffs, got beat by the Islanders. Mm-hmm. What were your first mm-hmm. thoughts when you met Herb Brooks, and what was it like to play for the man? Well, that's that's a great question because. You know, that whole scenario, we had Freddie Shiro as a coach when we started, and Freddie had a great career as a coach in Philadelphia. They fired him halfway through the year. Like you said, Craig came in and took over, um, and then we had that good run. So normally when you have a good run of the playoffs like that, you're not going to have a new coach come in, and you're not going to make a whole lot of changes. You know, we, you know, we'd gone to the semifinals. Yes, we lost to the Islanders, but they were in the middle of winning their four cups. Uh, so now all of a sudden uh, we trade a bunch of guys. Herb comes in. And I got to tell you, people ask me this all the time about Herb. When Herb walked in, so Herb had no NHL experience. Yes, he had the great you know, career at the Olympics and all that. But to his credit, and I learned a lot from Herb, too, just the way you know, about life and the way you carry yourself, your preparation and all that. He, when he walked in, he was so prepared and so confident, so sure of what he wanted to do every day. Like the full year schedule was laid out, like conditioning days, travel days, days off, all that kind of stuff. He was thorough. Uh, there was no hesitation. There was no asking anybody's opinion. This is the way Herb Brooks is going to run the team. This is the kind of guys he's going to have on the team. This is the way the team is going to play. Uh, this is the way the team is going to conduct itself. So, you know, instead of having a bunch of veteran guys thinking, God, what are we doing getting this new coach after we just won the semifinals? It was, I remember thinking, okay, that's it. I guess Herb's in charge. And, uh, and he was, he, um, he was for me, fantastic. You know, he didn't, like he said in the movie in the miracle, which is accurate. He says, I'm not looking for the best players. I'm looking for the right players. Like he wanted certain guys to fill certain roles. And if you didn't fit that role, it wasn't like he didn't like you, but you just, you didn't fit into his hockey team. So he weren't going to be on the team. I was fortunate. I fit a certain role for him. Um, In fact, I've told the story a lot, but uh, the day before our first game, we're practicing in our practice facility. Practice got done. And Herb now pulls everybody in the center ice. He makes a big speech about what everybody's role is. You know, Barry Beck, you're the captain of the team. You can do everything for us. And Ron Greshner, you're a great power play player and everything. And so he waited for me at the end. So now I'm in my, my sophomore year. I uh, had a good rookie year. I was really feeling confident about my career, where it was going. And uh, he says in front of everybody, he says, Laidlaw, when, when you get the puck, give it to somebody else. You're not supposed to have it. And the guy started dying laughing, and I was mortified. Like, what? You know, like, I I, I just slapped in the face. But I found out after that it was kind of like a a compliment that he felt I was tough enough mentally to handle that kind of stuff. In fact, that's what he wanted. He wanted the guys all to pull together. They did. They're all, like, 
rallying around kind of laughing at me. It was kind of funny, you know, well, sorry for them. Uh, but he thought I was, you know, I was one of his boys after and he, he had me in a role that, you know, I fit a role for him as a defensive player, get the puck up to the forwards, block shots, hit people. That's what he wanted me to do. And he made it very clear what he wanted. As long as I did it, I was going to get played, uh, get played a lot. So it was good. Yeah. And I think that's why he was so successful as a coach because everybody has yeah. a role. Everybody plays the role you win. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's, and there's no, yeah. Yeah, there's no exceptions. He was, uh, he, and he was the boss. You, you knew, and he knew he got to know the individuals. Like, again, you, you look at the movie and how he selected the team. That was very accurate. Like he spent a lot of time getting to know who we were from other coaches that had coached us. Like he knew with me, like I didn't want to be coddled or, you know, like it was late in the game and, you know, you're, you're, you've lost, you know, five or six pounds of water weight and you're beat up and bloody and everything. But if we're up a goal and he needs to be out there to go out there and kill a penalty or something with 30 seconds to go, he would never come down and ask me, say, Tommy, you okay? He would just come down, literally kick me in the rear end and say, get the F out there. And it kind of like he knew that's what I wanted because basically he was saying to me, I'd rather have you out there no matter how tired you are than anybody else in this role. So it was like inspiring to me, you know, like you'd, you'd be dead tired, but you'd fly over the boards because here's this coach who the, and the team that was counting on you so much, no matter how tired or beat up you were, they wanted you on the ice to do the job. So, and he knew that and not everybody was like that. Other players were different, but he knew how I was and he knew how everybody in the team was. Well, don't you think that's the key, whether you're running a business or a sports yeah. team, just being able to know that you can't treat everybody the same way. There's different buttons you have to push with different people. Totally. Yeah. And it's and the, uh, and being that leader too, like I said, you're right. It, whether you're the leader at home as a parent, as a teacher in school or a boss at work, it's, uh, it's being a guy that's prepared. And when you walk in the room, there's no question about your authority and your, uh, your, your preparation, how uh, the hard work that you put in and, and you have an exact vision. You're not, there is no, you're not asking for other people's opinion. I'm the dictator here. I'm the boss. This is the way it's going to be. Now underneath all that, there are other roles to be played, other leadership roles that, by the captain, by the assistant coaches, all that. But as far as being that head guy, you're right. It's, it's, that's life in general. Herb, Herb had a lot of things that, you know, uh, one of Herb's great lines was passes come from the heart. Uh, and what he meant literally when you're playing was if you're going to pass the puck to somebody, just don't hope that it goes on somebody's stick, make it go on the stick, put your heart into it. Uh, and it, was, it took me years later to realize that he wasn't talking just about the passes you make or, you know, certain parts of the game to play with your heart. He's talking about that in, in life. If you're going to do something, don't hope that it's going to work, put your heart into it and make it work. So he, he was great with that kind of stuff. We're, like he really like life lessons and like when he'd have those sayings, but it would mean many things. You could, you could apply it to many situations. Yeah. And the sad thing is Herb Brooks did a great job with the Rangers for about a four year span there. And the problem was those damn New York Islanders. Oh yeah. Oh, no question. I mean, we had some fantastic games like that series that we lost in, in 04 or excuse, uh, 84 when uh, Kenny Morrow scored a winning goal in overtime and gave five, five game series. Man, it was, uh, we, listen, we were probably as talented as a team as they were. They just, they had that way to win, but we weren't far behind. It was just those, you know, like I said, you know, you lose overtime. We actually should have won the night before a game in uh, Madison Square Garden. We had them two games to one. And again, it was a, a best of five series at that point. It was the first round of the playoffs. And if we just had a one in Madison Square Garden, we would have beat them. But, but they found a way to win. And that's, uh, that's the key to the way they played for, you know, five years. Yeah, because there's a few times there where I think you guys were probably the second best team and they were the best team. You just never got to the Stanley Cup Finals because of it. Yeah, totally. You know, and, and there's a few times during that run for them where they were. I remember a series against Pittsburgh really in the playoffs where Pittsburgh kind of had them, but they just couldn't finish them off. And they did that with a lot of teams where yeah, maybe maybe it looked like you had them, but they just they would always find a way to get it done. Yeah, and then 1985-86 season, um, Craig Patrick still there as the GM. Her Brooks is no longer there. What was the adjustment like to Ted Sater? Um, it was different. Um, you know, I, I try to be careful. I, I never, you know, you know what? It, Ted Sater not ended up being not. Uh, uh, let me see. How, how can I put it delicately? It just didn't work for Ted here. It, it did for a short period of time, but I think what we're seeing now with a few coaches like the Mike Keenan's, Mike Babcock, Ken Hitchcock. Uh, these kind of coaches want to they part of the strategy for coaching is kind of these mind games that they're playing. You know, they're going to push buttons to get you mad and everything like that. It's to me, 
I don't think it really ever worked. I think players more put up with it and then went and won. And then the coaches would get credit for having these, you know, these masters, like being the master scientist, you know, the bad scientist to find, find a way to push the buttons. I don't think that ever worked. And I think with Ted, that was kind of coach he was, uh, you know, and listen, I admired him in so many ways. He, again, you talk about preparation or hard work. He was certainly, you know, second to none in that category. It's just that um, he, he wanted to try to play these mind games with people and it just, it just didn't work. And I, in fact, it really, you know, whereas with Herb, like Herb was like more direct. Okay. If I, if I'm mad at you and I want you to do something, I'm just going to tell you I'm mad at you. I'm going to tell you what to do instead of playing a little game to try to get you mad to do what I ultimately want you to do. I think these are your coaching men and these men just, just tell me what you want. And if either, either they can do it and you'll know, play me or I won't do it and you won't play me. So um, I think that that's where Ted got himself in trouble. Yeah. And the Rangers 85, 86 had a losing record. Get in the playoffs though and beat yeah. the one seed, yep. the Flyers. You beat the two seed, the Capitals. You guys end up in the Wales conference finals, lose to the Montreal Canadiens, if I remember right, in five games. Yep. And those playoffs, yep. a lot of close games, beating the Flyers and Capitals. You want to talk a little bit about that season? Yeah, that well, playoff the guys run? Really, yeah. yeah, the guys really rallied together. And again, to the credit of the coaches, too. I mean, they were they were all part of it. So as much as I was a little critical of Ted and his staff, they, uh, you know, I, they were part of that run we had. But, you know, it, like happens, you see teams that do well in the playoffs or go on runs, you know, the guys all pull together. You get great goaltending. We had John Ben Beesbrock was playing great in net. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things I think once we, you know, we were in the series with Philly and ultimately beat them in the first round, it really got, now the guys kind of go, well, that's a tough series. We pulled together, like tough physically, and it really kind of rallies the guys together. And now you, you continue to go on your run. So it was, that was good. It was, you know, I, I was lucky I'd gone into the, semifinals my first year um and then you think to yourself well geez that's just going to happen all the time you're going to go that far in the playoffs and it didn't again until ultimately that year then you know in 85 86 all right 86 87 you end up with the kings what was it yeah. like when you were told that you were going to be moving on well you know it's funny uh you know as a pro athlete you know that trades are part of it most guys you know do not get to play their whole career in one city you know, I, that was my only team I played on. I was a captain, assistant captain. I won Players Player Awards. Uh, you know, so I, I just did kind of assumed I was always going to be there. Now, looking back, my my game had kind of fallen off. I'd hurt my back. I was missing games. Like, my first four years, I, I didn't miss any games due to an injury at all. In fact, it wasn't until my, you know, I, I missed two games at the end of uh, my second year, missed one, and then the end of my fourth year because her wanted to rest me going to the playoffs. And I didn't miss a game due to injury until my fifth year when I ruptured my spleen. But then all of a sudden now when I started hurting my back, it was like in and out of the lineup. And, you know, looking back at it, you know, as you know, Phil Spazio was the general manager at that time and ultimately traded me. And, and he did the right thing. I was not quite the player I had been before. And he was ultimately able to get, you know, Marcel Dion in here. So, uh, but it's a shock, you know, when you get traded. Like, again, you, I think if it's happened to you before, it's less of a shock. But the first time you get traded, it's uh you know, especially you're in New York, uh, you know, the whole, you're treated great here, playing in Manhattan. So, you know, they, and at that time in the 21 team league, you know, LA was kind of perceived to be, well, it wasn't much of a hockey town, right? Because, you know, it's LA and it was, there was no other Southern teams at that time, but uh, I was fortunate when I got traded there shortly after that. Uh, well, it's actually two things happened. It was kind of funny. Uh, you know, I was still kind of whining because I, I love New York so much, but it was the first Christmas Eve, um, that we're in LA. I don't know if we had a home that we had rented uh, and had a, a hot tub and a pool in the backyard. So on Christmas Eve, I was sitting out in the hot tub having a cocktail, and I'm thinking to myself, "Well, just maybe this isn't so bad after all." You know, <laughs> playing out in California. So, uh, so then, uh, and then the next year, Wayne Gretzky got traded there, and it became it was the place to be. I mean, I was so like I looked back at my career, and I think, geez, I got to play with Phil Zito and all these other guys. It started my career. So then I finished my career playing with, you know, Larry Robinson, Wayne Gretzky, Dave Taylor, all these great players. So I was very fortunate. And then L.A. was, it, it was like, it, we really were like a rock band everywhere we went because of Wayne. And, uh, you know, even at home, like all the movie stars are coming in uh, to the locker room after. And you know, at first, you're kind of in awe on the whole thing. And after a while, you're like, geez, can you get out of the way? You know, because <laughs> they're all over the place. But it was great. It was a great way to finish my career. Yeah, because you guys became the hockey version of the of Showtime, I guess. Yeah, totally. Yes. We, it was, you know, everywhere we went, uh, you know, because of Wayne, it was, you know, it was a Tuesday night playing in Chicago or wherever it was. 
you know, it was, it was a big deal. I mean, we went into games, you know, on a Saturday night, you know, cause, cause we were the Kings now and it was Wayne Gretzky's team. We would play games, like a lot of Saturday night games in Montreal. So it's hockey night Canada and everything. And, uh, I'll never forget one game. There's a, there's a great little linesman that was, uh, doing work in one game, Ray Scampanella. You know, when you've been in the league a long time, you kind of build relationships with the referees and everything. And never forget, we were playing a game on a Saturday night in Montreal with, you know, we, now we got the black and silver. And obviously, we had a good season going on. So it's late in the year. It was a big game. You can just feel the buzz. You know, it's, it's Montreal form, Wayne Gretzky, you know, all these great players and everything. And Scapanella, right before the starting uh, faceoff, I'm sitting on the bench there. He leans over to him and goes, Tommy, this is unbelievable. Like, he can feel it himself, you know. So, uh, to be part of those games and have them be that meaningful and, you know, that much of the center of the hockey world was, was a lot of fun. All right. Um, how difficult was it to transition from basically, I guess, normal life, from being an athlete to being just a normal person? Well, that's, you know, that's a great question. And I, I'm, I'm lucky now because I get to go do a lot of motivational speaking. I, mean, I talk to people about, you know, making adjustments in your life and, you know, you know kind of starting new things and, I was, I don't think I was really fortunate and it sounds strange saying it, but we really didn't make a lot of money. My, the first year in the NHL, I, my salary was $60,000 know, it was 1980, but still it was $60,000. I think the most I ever made was $300,000. Um, so I had a young family at the time, didn't have a lot of money. So I, I had to get right at it. I had to start my agent business right away. I decided I was going to go to my own and, and I had another couple of groups that wanted me to be kind of a recruiter for them. And I thought, well, no, I'd rather do it myself. So it was, I didn't have time to sit around and think too much, really. It literally, once I retired, it was, you know, within two weeks, I said, okay, let's go, let's get to work and start booking flights to, you know, go out to Western Canada and recruit players and, uh, and start that business. So uh, I was fortunate in that, you know, like I said, I, just, I had no choice but to get right after it. But it's still, you know, when you first are told that your career is over with, I'll never forget leaving the Great Western Forum and I had a meeting with Rogi Vasho, who was the GM at the time, and you know, I'd gone to training camp and my back is bad and looked like it was over with. And we had still a couple of years, my contracts we were working out a settlement and everything. And, uh, and just leaving the rink, knowing that, you know, I was never going to play hockey or in the NHL again. And I wasn't going to be part of a team. Wasn't going to be going to training camp. Uh, it was kind of a shock. It was, you know, I knew it was coming, but it was still like, wow, that's it. Uh, but again, like I said, I was just, I, and I was so fortunate. I think, you know, I just had to get right at it right away and get to work. So it was, uh, my transition was pretty easy, really. There's a lot of guys, even today, and it's funny, like, you know, you talk about the money part of it. It's even tougher on some guys now because they have made uh, enough money where they don't have to work right away. Or in some cases, maybe never have to work again. Uh, but then they got to think, well, okay, what am I going to do with my life? You know, and they become, in some cases, they, they view themselves as all they ever were was just a hockey player, but now hockey's gone. You know, for me, it was really important. Like, I was very proud of what I did to make it to the National Hockey League, but I didn't want that to define me. I wanted, you know, I was going to go off in the business world now and make a name for myself in the business world. And, you know, it was great that I happened to be a former player and, you know, showed that I had the work ethic and the leadership and all that. But but it was really important to me that, you know, now it's the next step. Let's get going and get to work. All right. Tell me a little bit about the True Grit lifestyle. Yes. So, uh Many years ago, my wife, my youngest son, I have two sons that are 26 and 29. My 26 year old was always pushing me to get into branding and marketing myself more. You know, the agent business had, uh, wind, was winding down and I was doing some financial work. And uh, he was always talking about getting on Facebook and Instagram. And I was kind of like, well, who really cares about this old NHL defenseman? I was, you know, uh, you know scored maybe two goals a year or whatever. And uh, he, to his credit, he saw that, you know, I, I had something unique. Well, it wasn't unique. It's just something that could be motivational, inspirational to other people. And it really, it made me kind of look back at my life. And as I talked about with my father, grandfather, like that mentality of getting up every day, uh, no excuses, doing the job right. Um, so that's really how the true grit life came around. That that's I already really lived that life because, like I said, I was never really one of the best players. I wasn't the smartest agent out there. My thing was that I would just always show up every day and do my job and do it right. So as a defensive defenseman, you know, like Curb said to me, Tommy, to get the puck, give it to somebody else. You're not supposed to have it. That's kind of became who I was. My job was to get the puck to somebody else, do my job and do it right every time. Uh, so that really is kind of part of the true red light. So now I get up every day at 3.30 in the morning, 
Uh, I make my bed perfect. Uh, and I got that from this is Navy SEAL Admiral that did a famous speech. This is William McRaven uh, talking. He was getting up in front of a graduating class and he was talking about the things he learned that really helped his life uh, when he was in as a Navy SEAL. And, you know, I think when you see the speech, you think well, he's going to talk about, you know, battles and wars and all that kind of stuff. Well, the first thing he talks about the importance of making your bed every morning and making it perfect before you leave the room. And it's, it's really has kind of changed my life in a lot of ways because, well, not really, but kind of, it, it's absolutely changed my life in a lot of ways. So when I get up every morning, I make my bed perfect every morning. It's made exactly the same way. And the idea is that that starts your day. And if you can't do little things like that the right way, then you can't do the big things the right way later on during that day or the rest of your life. So it starts me off. In fact, I make my bed perfect. And before I leave the room, I stop and I turn and look back at my bed. It's like, wow, you know, like it's you're fired up about something that you've done that you really don't have to do. But you've done it. And not just the fact that you've done it, but you've done it perfectly. And now you go out and so, so that starts my day. And I come downstairs and I'm big into being healthy and everything. So I've got a juicer where I juice up beets and ginger and cucumbers all together and put turmeric in it. And so that I have that the next step, and then I have my amino acids, and then I go out on a march. And my march is really just a walk, but the idea is you're trying to get the most out of each stride. The same thing, you're doing each stride perfectly, so it becomes a march. And uh, that's just really, that's become kind of the theme for my life. So then it's off to the gym, and, you know, when I got the gym, uh, pretty much all our workouts are done on a balance board now. So it really forces you to concentrate and doing the exercise perfectly, or else you're going to fall off the balance board. So again, it's that whole theme of doing it the right way when you do it. And that's, you try to do that with everything in your life. And you, and understanding too, that you're not going to be perfect. Like yeah, I'm pretty good with my diet, probably 90% of the time, but then I'll have times where I uh, slip up a little bit or you'll, you know, you'll intentionally give yourself a break, you know, a little, a little treat or whatever. But the key is I say to people, when they talk to them, you don't expect to be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes, but it's always progressing, always getting better. You know, I'm 60, I'll be 62 next month, and I'm probably in the best shape I've ever been in my life. And my goal is to keep getting better every day, always trying new things, learn more things about your diet and more, no better ways to exercise. Uh, and I'm really big on the mental part of life in general, and that I mean, we treat, spend so much training our bodies. Uh, I think we underestimate how much we can train our minds and how much more it's important to train our minds, especially as we get older, you know, to never you know, settle for being just who you are. Always push yourself to do more and get better at things. And I, I, just to me, it comes, you know, my father, uh, when he passed away, he had dementia. And, uh, you know, from playing contact sports, everybody thinks, well, you're just going to have a lot of brain potential, brain damage, and CTE and all these things. And I, I have just found with myself that the more I continue to push myself and just don't settle mentally or physically for just what I have today, always look to get better. I, I just feel better about my whole life. I feel more... I, better shape uh sharper mentally um and i just i feel like i'm just more positive and just enjoying my life a lot better than i ever have in my whole time my whole life yeah i think a lot of people don't realize because i'm kind of like you i mean i played college football basketball i'm like 51 now i'm in better shape than i've ever been and like 14 15 months ago i started losing weight i changed my diet i lost like i went from 300 pounds to 180 pounds since last january and most of it was off of diet and the thing i found is you know what you put in your body has a lot to do with your mind also and people don't realize that because i had a mother that passed away from dementia alzheimer's also and it's scary when you're watching them go like that and yeah. it's kind of a kick in the ass that maybe you need to change the way you're doing things i don't know about you but i wish that i would have realized all this stuff when i was 18 years old <laughs> yeah oh totally you're so right but you know what though i think it's even more important as you get older right i think physically you can although it's not right you can get away with more stuff especially with your diet when you're younger yeah. I think as you get older, it's even more important to have that diet nailed down. And, and I agree. Like it's to me, it's like people, people talk to me, well, God, I smoke cigarettes or, you know, I do this. I said, well, listen, don't, it's a process and, and don't look to be perfect because I think you beat yourself up mentally. And then you just say, oh, forget it. I'm just so far away from my goal. I'm just not even going to try yeah. where I'm saying to people, it's, it's about that process. And it's a glorious process too, where you start off one day, like you said, with you, you're a great example, and it's I admire you that you 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 knew you needed to lose weight. You knew you weren't going to lose all the weight in one day. It was going to take time. You had to do it the right way. 
And it just, I think it just snowballs from there that now you start to feel better about yourself and the whole idea of now even like cheating yourself and not treating yourself properly is even so remote from your mind right now. You just, you wouldn't even think of doing it, right? No. And uh, I can tell you this, I, I was one of those guys that would lose a bunch of weight then gain it back yeah. a few years later. But my thing was yeah. I got a job as a head coach for arena football team in like 2011. And I start seeing these pictures show up on the internet. And I'm like 285 then, and I'm thinking, damn, I don't want people to see me like that. So then sure. I lost like 85 pounds. The next three seasons, I stayed at that weight, we're on TV and stuff. And then I decided to stop doing that and coach my son's high school football team. So right. then I kind of get back in the process again. And if you look at my Facebook, you'll see like no pictures for me, 2016 to about last right. year. And then my sons both made a high school All-American game last year. And right. we post a picture of me with them. And I'm just thinking, you know, if I weighed what I weighed when I coached that arena football team, there'd probably be 300 right. more pictures of me with my kids. And oh, yeah. it, it really makes you think, I mean, what in the hell am I doing? You yeah. know? And most least, people yep. – just have no hope when they think that they think that everything is so far so long away but a year from now is not that long and people lose track that the big picture is really not that far away yeah totally no you're right i mean and it's and i think too like i actually had a quote that i posted today like motivational monday it was like what one man can do another man can do so i think sometimes people think well Okay, like you, for example, you probably a lot of people look at you and go, geez, I wish I could do what he did. Well, anybody can, really. You've got to get that through your head that, yeah. I, like, and I've been so lucky to be around so many great athletes, and it sounds like you were too, where you realize, like a guy like Wayne Gretzky, for example, he did, he wasn't, think, sometimes people think he, these athletes are given some special gift. And obviously with maybe like a LeBron James, he was born taller and all that kinds of stuff. But most athletes don't have some special gift. Most successful business people don't have some special gift. They just showed up and continued to work. They didn't take no for an answer. I mean, it's all the stories about, you know, Walt Disney getting fired from the job, saying he wasn't creative enough and all this kind of stuff. But he, he just didn't take no for an answer. And it's the same thing. If anybody that does anything great in their life, they usually are not given some special gift. In fact, I don't believe hardly any of them are given a special gift. It's that they have decided that they're going to do it. And that they realize I'm just I'm not going to do it just one day, but I'm going to do it the next day and the next day and the next day. It's all that process. Well, see, I think a lot of people are afraid to try things just because of fear of failure and fear of not oh, being totally. good enough. And I think yep. that 90 percent of everything we do in our life, maybe 100 percent, is just all in our heads. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But that's what, yeah, exactly. And that's why I go back to that mental training, right? Where you say, you just you keep saying to yourself, I hear people say all the time, oh, I can't do that. Or, I'm not good enough to do that. Or somebody else can do that. And it's like, again, it's like once you start to train your mind, like anything else, when you first try to bench press 135 pounds, you can't do it. But then you, so you go back and you continue to work at it, work at it. Well, then you come back in a month, now you bench press 135 pounds. So it's no different with your mind. You can train your mind to do things that you didn't think you can do. And it's, it's the little steps like making your bed right in the morning and getting up every day and eating the healthy foods, being disciplined to eat the healthy foods, being disciplined to get out the door and do your walk, your march. Uh, and it, now you train your mind, okay, listen, I couldn't do that before, but now I'm doing it. Like when I go on my march, I go up a hill too. And I'm, you know, I'm, first you're breathing heavy and then you realize, you know, I'm not breathing heavy anymore because I've trained myself to get up that hill. So it's just that whole it's a whole process with your mind is the same way that you now have can, you've given yourself a license to be a more confident person because you know you can do things that maybe you couldn't do a month ago or a year ago. Yeah, and I've met so many people that tell me, "Well, I need to lose a hundred pounds. How do you do it?" And I smoke and I drink. I said, "Well, how about this? Maybe just concentrate first on losing some weight. Once you start losing weight, stop drinking." Once yeah. you've stopped drinking a few months later, you can stop smoking because the thing is this, probably the toughest of the three, I don't know, but my guess would be to quit smoking. So, yeah. but if you've already got a base where, hell, I lost it. I lost yeah. 50 pounds. I stopped drinking. Well, hell, I can do yeah. this last one without a problem. It's all mindset. Oh. Yeah, totally it is. Like, I, I, I do a lot of coaching of coaches that coach kids, and I, I give them examples. I said, so we, you've got such a huge uh, – impact on these kids not just because, as athletes but as people so if you teach them okay this like so in a hockey sense uh, maybe a kid wants to be defensive but he can't skate backwards 
So now you do a whole bunch of that early in the year. He's playing defense. He's not playing well or anything. But now during the season, as the season gets going, you practice skating backwards more and more. Now all of a sudden he becomes a very good backwards skater. And he, now he's able to play defense properly because he's a good backwards skater. So now what you've done, you just like you're talking, you build that young guy's confidence up. So the next time he goes and tries something, maybe at school or at a job or whatever, and if he can't do it, he doesn't get discouraged and says, oh, I can't do it. He, he'll say, well, yes, I can't do it right now, but that doesn't mean I won't be able to do it in a month. And now he gets to work and teaches himself and he works at it and learns how to do it. And now he's that stronger person, right? So that's just, I mean, as a coach, you've got a huge ability there. Plus now, once you've done that, now that young man or young girl now looks at you and like whatever you say to do, they're going to do because they know it works. They know that you have guided them in the right direction and showed them how to do something they couldn't do. So it's, it's a pretty powerful thing. I think for kids in general, you know, specifically, but I think for anybody at any age, really. Yeah. Um, all right. I got to ask you about this because I can't have you on without asking about survivor. How did you yeah. end up on survivor? <laughs> so, uh, it all started, uh, Jerry Bruckheimer, who's a big hockey fan. In fact, I think he's even one of the owners in Seattle, of the new franchise. Um, he's, and I think I've got this correct. I think he owns a piece of Survivor, Big Brother, Amazing Race. I think that's what it is. And he reached out to the NHL to look for guys, two guys to be on Amazing Race. Now, they didn't come just to me, but because I was in New York and I was in shape and everything, they asked me if I wanted to do it. Uh, but we couldn't fit anybody to go with me. It had to be somebody that was in my age group that I played with, was friends with, that had a U.S. passport, was in shape, and wasn't anybody that kind of fit. So they asked me about Survivor. And uh, so I really wasn't sure with Survivor. I mean, I'd watched Survivor, but I, I needed to watch a lot more. You know, as you know, with Survivor, there's a lot of conniving, you know, and lying to people and misleading and all that. And I'm in the middle of building this brand of True Grid Life, which is all about, you know, discipline and integrity and everything. Yeah. So I didn't think it's fit, but then I you know, talked to a few people and realized, okay, you don't, there's a lot of different, like anything else, a lot of different ways to play. You don't have to play like everybody else is playing. Plus it's a game. It's not really who you are. So I said, all right, let me go through the process. So they, they brought me out to uh, LA for casting. And, uh, I, you know, part of it was they were looking for people with a personality. And it, I think it helped me that I was older, been through a lot of stuff and interviewed a lot that wasn't afraid to be in front of a camera and all that kind of stuff. So I, like when I walked into the meetings, uh, the, the interviews with Jeff Probst, the host, and there's some other couple of other producers and some people from CBS there. That I was giving it to, him. I was giving him a hard time. I was calling him Proby and all this kind of stuff and joking around. And uh, and he asked, he had these two women from CBS uh, in the room. And near the end of the interview, he turned to them. He says, "So what do you think of them?" Right in front of me and everything. And uh, one woman goes, I, "I like him. You know, he's confident but not cocky." And the other woman goes, "Oh no, no, he's totally cocky." And uh, so it's kind of like. Yeah, you know, if you're doing an interview or something like that, that's kind of what you want, right? You want to know that you've got that personality going. So, uh, so that whole process went well, and then um, uh, they, you know, I think God, it was months before they finally get back to you. They they did a lot of. I was really surprised how much psychological testing they do on you. I think part of it is they know from past history who like who who they want to mesh together, like what personality traits do they want meshing together? They want some conflict or people form an alliance, all that kinds of stuff. And plus, I think with me, because I had a number of concussions, they really wanted to make sure that I was, you know, not going to flip on yeah. myself. Like, oh, <laughs> it tested me a lot. Um, and during that whole process, it's kind of funny, you know, um, I tell a story about to where they, they do the psych tests on you and then they sit down, the doctor sits down with you and kind of analyzes all the tests. And this very nice female doctor who sits down, the first thing she says is, uh, says, Tom, uh, you have a hard time with empathy. And uh, I'm thinking, I don't know how most guys are, but I'm thinking to myself, do I even know what that word means? I was like, <laughs> and uh, so uh, I tried to trick her into telling me what her definition of it because I, in my mind, I'm thinking I got a, def, a, a rough definition, but I'm, I'm trying to trick her and I'm going, what's your definition of empathy? Uh, and she starts laughing at me. She says, you don't even know what it means, do you? So we had a good chuckle about that and we kind of analyzed what empathy really was. And um, I guess I'm like, you know, I, I, a lot of men that are driven and everything. It's like, you know, I see a problem and I want to have a solution and get the problem fixed instead of, instead of being empathetic to somebody's feelings and everything. So, uh, so that's opening up the whole floodgate. So I'm trying to be more empathetic, but it, it seems like it's either the task on or it's off. So it's uh, learning how to regulate that. So, so that whole went through the whole process of the casting. And then they called me back a few months and said, you're on the show. And, uh, and uh, I really had to get to work and watch a lot more shows because the game and you, over the years has really evolved. And, um, you know, at first it was a lot about building alliances. Now it's a lot more gameplay. There's a lot more strategy and, you know, backstabbing and saying one thing, meeting another. So 
you really, I really had to get a handle on, you know, first of all, what's going on in the game now, and then how do I want to play it? Because I really, listen, I went there to win, but I also went there, you know, I wanted to present myself a certain way. You know, I wanted yeah. to be, you know, I wanted to live like the true good life. In fact, I told them when we were out there in L.A., that, listen, here's how I live. I get up at 3.30, you know, I go for the march, my diet and all that kinds of stuff. I said, if I go, if you choose me to play, that's how I'm going to be. That's who I am. That's just not an act. That's how I live my life. And they said, that's fine. That's that's what we want. So, so we went out and played. All right. So you look back on it. Was it a good decision? Um, yeah, it was good. I think, well. I don't know if you watched. Did you watch this the season I was I, on? To did tell you... you the truth, I have not watched Survivor since about season yeah. ten. Yeah, I didn't even know you were actually... on it until I did a little research. I mean, I yeah. asked you to be on it because I remembered you from the Rangers. Sure. So they uh, they had a little bit of a conflict. Not a little bit. It was it ended up being a big conflict this year. We had one uh, gentleman. Oh God, I think he's probably in his late forties or whatever. Married, with a child, and everything, and. Uh, he was very uh, hands-on with the, a lot of the young women on the show. In fact, to the point where they, they'd asked him to, to stop touching them. Like he was really getting inappropriate and everything. He didn't stop. Uh, and he continued to be on the show. It got to the point where one of the young girls was really upset about it. And they'd all got together and, and they were going to vote. They were going to vote him off because partly because they wanted to get him off. Or they was, they didn't want him around because he was so inappropriate. Yeah. Um, it ended up the young girls, uh, I, I, I really, they were good people. I don't think they realized how it was going to come off. They ended up using that in the gameplay and getting, they voted off the girl, ultimately voted off the girl who wanted to vote off the guy. Um, so when it, the show aired, uh, the Me Too movement, rightfully so, was pretty upset with them to the point where they, the girls received some death threats because basically they were undermining what they were trying to accomplish with the Me Too movement where you know to, women should not have to be yeah. Uh, not believed when that kind of stuff, all that, all that was going on. So it became, I had gotten voted off before all that happened. So I was not part of, part of that, but still it, was, it really kind of took over the show uh, partly. And uh, so for that part, it, it, I, I don't think I'm like remembered from being on that show that happened that way. And I, I think I got voted off early enough. I was voted off fifth overall, uh, but it was, it was unfortunate that kind of came into our show, but it was uh but the big thing for me is it was one of those things that personally it's just it was a challenge that you know again I was I turned 61 when I was out there in the show taping it um, and I and I've always said to people just like we're talking today if you have a goal or a dream don't let your age or your height or your weight or the color of your skin or whatever it is stop you from pursuing your dreams and your goals so when I now go talk to people I can say to them you know even more so like whether it's being an NHL player or being an agent or being on Survivor. You could always accomplish your goals no matter what. You've got to go and give it a try. So from that standpoint, it kind of enhances the whole, you know, what I'm trying to, to say to people. So, yeah, it was good. I had, a, I had a good time. All right. Tell everybody about your podcast and where they can hear it. Sure. Sure. So um, so we do – actually, I do two uh, – well, like twice a week, Monday and Wednesdays at 1030. We go on Facebook Live. It then goes on to my uh, YouTube channel. I do a podcast with Kevin Allen, who write, used to be the uh, head hockey writer with USA Today. He's retired now. Um, I do another podcast. Uh, we use this on Thursdays right now uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning. Again, it's on Facebook Live, my Facebook page. It's just Tom Laidlaw. I do actually with Elaine, who is Elaine Stott, who was on uh, Survivor with me. Uh, she's from Kentucky. Hilarious girl, great personality. She became a very popular figure on the show. Uh, her and I were out there. We got, both got the same kind of personalities of picking on each other. So we do a podcast. We have a lot of fun. Uh, and then we do random other, uh, you know, we'll get former players on. Uh, again, you can always go to my YouTube channel. They're always stored there. And again, uh, they're always stored on the YouTube channel, but they're always on Facebook Live on my page as well. So uh, we've got a book coming out here shortly called True Grit Life. And uh, we've got our website, truegoodlife.com, where I have a lot of my writings on there. And um, so and we're very fortunate, although with this, uh, uh, this virus, it's just slow guys and slow things down and stopped them entirely. I'm doing a lot of public speaking, a lot of things with the Rangers and uh, the National Hockey League going out and speaking to kids and coaches and businesses and everything. But again, that's all stopped right now, unfortunately. So a lot more important things to worry about. All right, Tom, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. It was great having you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Nice talking to you. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up. Did you have a Twitter handle you wanted to let people know about? Yeah, yeah at T-Lades. Uh, again, uh, Facebook is Tom Laidlaw, and on Instagram, it's Real Tom Laidlaw. Again, our website is uh, uh, TrueGritLife.com. 
All right, guys. Make sure you check out True Li- True Life Grit. True Grit Life. Com. Yep. True Grit Life dot com. We'll see. I was hitting ahead from the age of five to about twenty two, <laughs> so sometimes I forget stuff too. That but, happens. That happens. All right, guys, remember you can hear all of our podcasts on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, over 300 different outlets. You can follow me at The Grueling Truth. But for now, for Tom Laidlaw, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.